In the midst of winter, when families gather to celebrate peace and joy, a sinister shadow loomed over the picturesque town of Dover, Arkansas. It was December 1987, a time meant for festivity and love, but for one family, it became a scene of overwhelming horror. This is the chilling tale of the Christmas killer Ronald Gene Simmons, a man who transformed the season of giving into a time of unspeakable tragedy. But what leads a person to destroy what they once cherished? What darkness lies within the human mind that can turn a father into a monster? From decorated war hero to a man convicted of the worst family massacre in American history, we'll delve into the depths of a mind clouded by secrets and rage, where the line between protector and predator became fatally blurred. To understand the mind behind the massacre, we must journey back to the origins of Ronald Gene Simmons, his story begins not with violence, but with a seemingly ordinary life, marked by service and family. Ronald Gene Simmons was born on July 15, 1940, in Chicago, Illinois. His father died of a stroke when Ronald was three. His mother got married again in less than a year to a civil engineer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who was transferred to Arkansas. Little is known about Simmons' early childhood, but it was a life that took a turn towards discipline and commitment when Ronald dropped out of school and enlisted in the United States Navy in 1957 and later the U.S. Air Force. Simmons served with distinction. Over a 22-year career, he received several commendations, including the Bronze Star Medal, the Republic of Vietnam Gallantry Cross, and the Air Force Ribbon for Excellent Marksmanship. But behind the facade of a decorated military man, there were undercurrents of turmoil. Simmons married Rebecca Ulibari in 1960 in New Mexico, and together they had seven children. However, the veneer of a normal family life was shattered in 1981 when allegations emerged that Simmons had been sexually assaulting his 15-year-old daughter, Sheila, and had fathered a child with her. Fearing prosecution, Simmons uprooted his family moving them from New Mexico to a desolate 13-acre tract of land in Pope County, 6.5 miles north of Dover, Arkansas, known as Mockingbird Hill. This property, isolated and ringed with a makeshift fence, up to 10 feet tall, became a fortress of sorts, a place where Simmons could exert total control. The residents didn't have a phone or indoor plumbing. But what was it that drove a man of discipline and service to the edge of such darkness? Was it the fear of losing control over his family? The desperation to conceal his illicit acts? Or something deeper, a more sinister aspect of his psyche yet to be revealed? The facade of the family man began to crumble, revealing a tyrannical figure, ruling his household with an iron fist. The family, once a symbol of joy and unity, became prisoners in their own home. This descent into tyranny was but a prelude to the horror that would unfold, unraveling the chilling transformation of Ronald Gene Simmons from a respected military man to one of the most notorious mass murderers in American history. In November 1979, Simmons retired from the Air Force and military service. He did some low-paying jobs in the nearby town of Russellville, Arkansas. He worked as an accounts receivable clerk at Woodline Motor Freight but had to resign after multiple reports of inappropriate sexual advances. He worked for about a year and a half at a Sinclair Mini Mart, but had to quit on December 18, 1987, because of low wages. Two of the elder children, Billy and Sheila, had moved out, got married, and started their own families. So by the time of the murders, there were only seven people living in the house. The calm of the holiday season in 1987 was shattered in Dover, Arkansas, by a series of heinous crimes. Ronald Gene Simmons' descent into murderous madness began shortly before Christmas, on December 22nd. The Simmons family home, once a haven of domestic life, turned into a chilling stage for an unthinkable act. Ronald Gene Simmons, armed with a 22 caliber pistol, commenced a killing spree that would become the worst family massacre in American history. His first victims were his wife, 46-year-old Rebecca, and eldest son, 26-year-old Ronald Jr., bludgeoned with a crowbar and shot. And he strangled Ronald Jr.'s daughter and his granddaughter, three-year-old Barbara. Their demise was just the beginning. 
Simmons lay in wait for his other children, feigning a festive spirit, only to mercilessly end their lives, one by one. Later that day, the Dover school bus dropped off the younger kids for their Christmas break from school. In a macabre ritual, Simmons systematically strangled and drowned his younger children, displaying a level of brutality that defies comprehension. The youngest victims, mere toddlers, met a similar fate, their innocence stolen in the most atrocious way. Simmons told them he had gifts for each of them, which he wanted to give one at a time, then strangled them and held under the water in a rain barrel. First to receive her gift was his eldest daughter, 17-year-old Loretta. His three other children, 14-year-old Eddie, 11-year-old Marianne, and 8-year-old Becky were murdered in the same brutal manner. He then dumped the bodies in one of the cesspits he had made his children dig days before. But the horror did not end there. On December 26th, as the rest of the world celebrated, Simmons' remaining family members arrived for a holiday visit, unaware of the nightmare that awaited them. 23-year-old Simmons's son, Billy, his 21-year-old daughter-in-law, Renata, and their child were the next to fall victim to his unfathomable rage. Billy and Renata were both shot dead. Their bodies were left by the dining room table next to the decorated Christmas tree with unopened gifts and covered with their own coats and some bedding. Then their 20-month-old son, Trey, was strangled and drowned. The same fate befell his 24-year-old daughter, Sheila, her 33-year-old husband, Dennis, and their children. Simmons strangled his and Sheila's child, six-year-old Sylvia, and finally, his 21-month-old grandson, Michael. The bodies were meticulously laid out, a grim tableau that defied any sense of humanity. He then covered their bodies with coats. Sheila's body was laid on the dining room table and covered with Rebecca Simmons' best tablecloth. He wrapped the bodies of Trey and Michael in plastic sheeting, and they were left in abandoned cars behind the Simmons' home. Simmons then embarked on a chillingly ordinary series of errands, his actions a stark contrast to the carnage he had just inflicted. He drove to a Sears store in Russellville to pick up Christmas gifts previously ordered for his family. That night he went out for a drink at a local bar. When he returned home, he spent the night and the next day drinking beer and watching television surrounded by the dead bodies of his family. On December 28th, the killing spree spilled over into the town of Russellville. In the morning, Simmons drove a car that had belonged to his son, Ronald Jr., to a Walmart in Russellville and purchased a second firearm. Fueled by a mix of revenge and rage, Simmons targeted those he felt had wronged him. The violence was indiscriminate, claiming the lives of acquaintances and strangers alike. His former workplace, a law firm, became the stage for his continued rampage. 24-year-old Kathy Kendrick, a secretary who had rebuffed his advances, was his first victim. She was fatally shot. The brutality continued at the Taylor Oil Company, where he shot and wounded the 38-year-old owner, Russell Taylor, who was also the owner of Sinclair Mini Mart, from which Simmons had recently resigned. He also killed a complete stranger in the building and shot at another employee before exiting the building, but missed. In Sinclair Mini Mart, Simmons shot and wounded two more people. He then shot his former supervisor, 35-year-old Joyce Butts, twice and wounded her in the office of Woodline Motor Freight. She survived and testified later that Simmons had yelled at her during a previous argument about wages. The entire rampage lasted 45 minutes. Two people were killed and four wounded. Simmons' final act was as perplexing as it was chilling. He said to the secretary in Woodline Motor Freight, I just wanted to kill Joyce. Just Joyce. I've gotten everybody who wanted to hurt me. Simmons surrendered to police without resistance, his spree of violence concluding as abruptly as it had begun. But the most heinous of his crimes were yet to be discovered. Simmons sat silently in his cell and stared at the wall. He refused to speak to investigators or even his attorneys. He didn't say a word during the interrogation. But when he was asked about his family, Simmons' eyes got red and started to well up. His lip started to quiver. The police got suspicious. They couldn't reach his family, so two officers drove to the isolated home. The investigation began on the chilling grounds of the Simmons family home. Here, 
detectives encountered a scene that defied belief. Family members' bodies laid out with a chilling meticulousness. It was a tableau that spoke volumes about the mindset of the killer. In the aftermath of this unprecedented massacre, questions swirled. What drove a father, a husband, a war veteran to commit such unspeakable acts against his own family and community? And what can we learn from this tragedy to prevent such horrors in the future? In the wake of the horrific murders committed by Ronald Gene Simmons, law enforcement faced the daunting task of piecing together a puzzle that spanned both family tragedy and public rampage. As the probe widened to include Simmons' subsequent attacks in Russellville, the challenge for investigators was to understand the connection between the family murders and the seemingly random acts of violence that followed. The evidence gathered was overwhelming. Firearms, witness testimonies, and Simmons' own actions painted a picture of a man who, after committing an unspeakable act against his own family, sought to extend his vengeance to those he perceived had wronged him in the wider community. In a case that stunned even seasoned investigators, the question wasn't just who had committed these crimes, but why. What drives a man to annihilate his family and lash out at the world around him? The arrest of Ronald Gene Simmons brought an end to the immediate threat, but it was just the beginning of a quest for justice and understanding. The prosecution's task was to unravel the mind of Simmons, to present a narrative that could make sense of the senseless. As the investigation progressed, more disturbing details emerged. Allegations of abuse, control, and a life led under the tyranny of Simmons became the focus. Each piece of evidence added another layer to the dark portrait of a man who had lived a life of deception and brutality. In the courtroom, the full extent of his crimes would come to light, bringing some answers, but also leaving haunting questions about the nature of evil. What kind of man lurked behind the annihilation of his family and terrorizing a community? Simmons' life was marked by strict discipline and control, traits honed during his military career. But beneath the surface of this structured exterior lay a tumultuous inner world. Allegations of sexual assault within his family suggest deep-seated pathological behavior. Experts in criminal psychology often point to a history of abuse, either experienced or perpetrated, as a significant factor in the development of violent behavior. In Simmons' case, the blurring of boundaries within his own family, coupled with a need for dominance, may have contributed to his downward spiral. The isolation of the Simmons family at Mockingbird Hill paints a picture of a man intent on exerting absolute control. This isolation could have exacerbated existing mental health issues, creating a pressure cooker environment. What then triggered Simmons to turn to murder? The possibility of his wife seeking a divorce might have been the tipping point, challenging his authoritarian hold over his family. She had already tried to leave him on numerous occasions, but always returned. A family friend informed the police that Simmons' wife had been saving up money to divorce him when the murder happened. Simmons' wife had written to their son shortly before the killings. I don't want to live the rest of my life with Dad. I am a prisoner here and the kids too. Every time I think of freedom, I want out as soon as possible. Simmons' actions in Russellville suggest a broader rage directed not just at his family, but at anyone he perceived as a threat or who had rejected him. His targeting of individuals in the community indicates a blend of personal vendetta and displaced aggression. Yet the absence of any recorded mental illness diagnosis leaves us with more questions than answers. The depths of Simmons' mind remain, in many ways, a locked enigma. Could this tragedy have been averted? In exploring these questions, we confront the unsettling reality of how little we sometimes know about those closest to us. After the chilling massacre by Ronald Gene Simmons, the wheels of justice began to turn, bringing us to a courtroom where the grim details of his crimes would be laid bare. After a psychiatric evaluation, it was determined that he was sane and capable to stand trial. Simmons' trial was a focal point of national attention, a legal battle to seek justice for the unprecedented atrocity he had committed. The proceedings were swift, reflecting the urgency of a community seeking closure. 
In May 1988, Simmons stood trial for the murders outside his family, specifically the killings of Kathy Kendrick and Jim Chaffin. The evidence presented was overwhelming, leaving little doubt about Simmons' guilt. Simmons, who had acted with such brutality, now faced the consequences of his actions in a court of law. His demeanor in court was reported as defiant, a stark contrast to the calculated coldness of his crimes. On May 12, 1988, the verdict was delivered. Ronald Gene Simmons was found guilty and sentenced to death by lethal injection, plus 147 years. Remarkably, Simmons himself requested that no appeal be made on his behalf, saying, to those who oppose the death penalty, in my particular case, anything short of death would be cruel and unusual punishment. Because of this, he had to be separated from other prisoners on death row. His life was in danger, as they believed Simmons' refusal to appeal his death sentence was jeopardizing their prospects of escaping their own executions. The second trial for the murders of his 14 family members began in February 1989. Here, the prosecution delved into the harrowing details of the family massacre, painting a picture of a man driven by control and rage. During the trial, a shocking moment unfolded. Simmons lashed out in court, punching the prosecutor and attempting to seize a deputy's gun, an act that only added to his infamy. This happened after Simmons' letter to his daughter Sheila was introduced, in which Simmons said, You have destroyed me, and you have destroyed my trust in you. I will see you in hell. After she had disclosed that he was her child's father to the police, on February 10, 1989, Simmons was found guilty of 14 counts of capital murder. The judge, undeterred by Simmons' outburst, handed down another death sentence. This rapid succession from trial to sentence was unprecedented, reflecting the severity of the crimes. The execution warrant for Simmons was signed by Arkansas Governor and later President Bill Clinton on May 31, 1990. All visitors, including legal counsel and clergy, were refused by Simmons. On June 25th, he died via the fatal injection method he had chosen in the Cummins unit. This was the shortest period from sentence to execution to death in U.S. history since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. His last words were, justice delayed finally be done is justifiable homicide. Nobody claimed his body, and he was buried in a common grave in Lincoln County, Arkansas. As we reflect on the legal proceedings against Ronald Gene Simmons, we are left to ponder the balance between justice and understanding. The case of Ronald Gene Simmons is a stark reminder of the potential for hidden dangers within our own homes and it's crucial to recognize early warning signs. FBI profilers and psychologists suggest vigilance for certain behaviors, patterns of control, isolation, and abuse within a family. These can often be precursors to more violent actions. In cases like Simmons, where the perpetrator isolates the family, the intervention of external agencies becomes critical. Neighbors, friends, and relatives need to be attentive and proactive in reporting any suspicions. But perhaps the most profound lesson lies in understanding the human psyche. Simmons' case demonstrates the complex interplay of psychological factors that can lead to such extreme behavior. What led Ronald Gene Simmons to commit such heinous acts? The answer lies in a complex web of control, abuse, and psychological instability. His desire for dominance coupled with deep-seated issues likely stemming from his abusive behavior within the family, set the stage for tragedy. Simmons' military discipline, juxtaposed with his chaotic personal life, created a volatile mix. The isolation and control he exerted over his family only fueled his capacity for violence. And when his authority was threatened, possibly by a looming divorce, it may have been the catalyst for the massacre. John Harris, one of Simmons's defense attorneys said of his abused family, I think he felt like they are going to take him out. He's going to take them out first. I think that was his mindset. Could anything have been done to prevent the carnage? In hindsight, the warning signs were there. Isolation, abuse, and a man teetering on the edge. Timely intervention could perhaps have altered this tragic course. Simmons' story is a grim reminder that behind closed doors, Within seemingly normal families, 
the seeds of tragedy can grow unnoticed. People feared him even back then in New Mexico. They said he was strange, unfriendly, antisocial. He didn't have much to say. A friend of his daughter's said, He had a beer in his hand all the time. He had one little room he would stay in all the time. It was dark and seemed spooky, and it stunk. Attorney John Harris also said that there was more than one person to blame. If authorities had successfully arrested him back in 1981 on the basis of his daughter's sexual assault, the murders likely wouldn't have happened. However, prosecutors at the time said they had dropped the charges at the family's request. Ronald Jean Simmons' Christmas week killing spree is the worst mass murder committed by a single person in Arkansas history. What were the underlying reasons that made Simmons annihilate his whole family that once formed the core of his identity? Tell me in the comments. Thank you for joining me on True Crime Case Files. To my viewers, your thirst for understanding these complex narratives keeps me driven. Please, share your thoughts in the comments. For more deep dives into the challenging mysteries and captivating true crime stories, subscribe to my channel. In the next episode, I'll uncover another chilling case that awaits its turn in the spotlight. Not to miss it, hit the bell for notifications and be part of the journey through the unexplored paths of true crime. See you next time.